Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It is July 19th, 2013. Now, we have some very important information for you today. We have a revisit of the Boston bombing. This is going to be some very hard-hitting information. So if you're confused about the Boston bombing, if you don't know all the details, well, I can't go over all the details in the time I have, but the best I can into the abilities of myself and the crew, we'll give you a nice, thorough breakdown so you can see the falsification that is going on in this scandal. So let's go straight to it. Top story headline, Zokar Zarnay of Throat Wound, Another Government Lie Bites the Dust. This is by Kurt Nimmo. Back in April, federal officialdom told us that Boston bombing suspect Zokar Zarnayev was shot and unable to speak in the throat. Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick says Zarnayev was in serious but stable condition and not able to communicate as of yet. Now you can see the picture of the younger brother right there. And you can see clearly this man does not appear to be bleeding from the throat as he has no blood trickling down the front of his shirt. You would think he would be gushing blood from that uh, particular area of his body. But he definitely is not. Now, this article, or should I say this image, was released by one uh, a officer, Sergeant Sean Murphy of the Massachusetts State Police. And he says he didn't like the way that uh, Zokar was viewed or displayed on the Rolling Stones magazine. As some of you guys have probably seen that cover by now. And what, to me, looks like a Facebook picture, but, you know, maybe somebody thought it was a glorification of him. So he released this image, and now he's under uh, investigation, that particular officer, for releasing the image that you see right there on your screen. And it just goes to show there's a lot of things, a lot of iffy things about this whole case. You know, uh, the younger brother recently appeared in court. People said he didn't seem like himself. He didn't even sound the same. Tarnayev walked into the courthouse wearing an orange prison suit. He has big bushy hair. It doesn't look like he's cut it since April. He stood tall at the defense table, and on several occasions, after a handful of the counts were read, he leaned forward to the microphone, at times very close, and with a thick Russian accent said, not guilty. Uh, give me a kiss. Okay. No, give me a kiss. Girl. Now get out. No, girl. Okay, okay, come here. Give me another kiss. Okay. He leaned forward to the microphone, at times very close, and with a thick Russian accent said, not guilty. Uh, okay, okay, come here. Give me another kiss. And with a thick Russian accent said, not guilty. Okay, so you saw the clip right there. That was the younger brother, uh, his court appearance. You heard the, uh, the anchor or the reporter right there saying that he leaned into the microphone and spoke with a thick Russian accent. And you saw right there, maybe you heard what you may be able to consider an accent. It definitely didn't seem thick or Russian to me, but, you know, to each his own. And not only did he not sound the same, he didn't even look the same. He had a cast on his left hand. Uh, his face looked a, l a little disfigured, uh, almost swollen. Uh, not sure how, how to really characterize it, but it, it did look like he had some impact on his face. Um, it, was, it was hard for me to believe that he was, he was sitting down there. Uh, it wasn't the same guy. He was a changed person, I guess. It wasn't the same guy. He was a changed person, I guess. Why did you... The way he looked, the way he kept moving his body, his posture and all that. So you see it right there, the witnesses, they say, you know, it wasn't the same guy. And maybe they're speculating, so, you know, maybe he wasn't himself. Maybe he doesn't normally act like that. But, you know, we've heard the reports that, you know, he didn't cut his hair. He didn't seem to be like himself. It's a very strange situation. And somebody may point out that, you know, the family was there and they didn't say anything. Well, we see the family such as uh, Uncle Ruslan, who has ties to the CIA, the older brother who has ties to the CIA, which we'll talk about in one moment, uh, the aunt who was on our show, and we'll talk about her in one moment as well. Uh, she said, you know, she had been threatened, basically, uh, not to come on our show after she had talked to David Knight and also Alex Jones. So, you know, that may be a reason for them to remain silent in these very trying times. And also, I want to just hit a few bullet points before we move on. Keep in mind, with the Boston bombing, we have no surveillance footage of the brothers actually placing the bomb. Uh, the uncle has ties to the CIA as well as the, uh, the older brother. Uh, they didn't rob the 7-Eleven. We'll talk about that. And also, the police officer who was shot, there's really no evidence linking the uh, the shooting of the officer the mit officer to the boston brothers other than the fact that they were on a alleged crime spree at the time but other than that there's no evidence linking them to that now let's move on to a point i was making earlier tamlin tamerlan's Zarnayev attended cia sponsored workshops now this is the older brother you can see him right there and we'll take a look at the first paragraph here tamlin's Zarnayev attended a workshop sponsored by cia linked jamestown foundation now uh, myself and david knight had a chance to speak to uh, 
FBI whistleblower Seabell Edmonds, and she told us, you know, they like these young college guys who can speak multiple languages, and these are the kind of guys that they like to recruit into the feds. So anybody who would ask, you know, how are these guys going to recruit to the CIA, that's a reason how right there. And also, we'll look at some more things here. So we see the older brother. He's a, you know, strong, athletic guy. You know, he could allegedly be the naked man. We'll talk about in that in just one second. But first, let's go and listen to this interview David Knight did with the aunt of the suspect, Ideen, the older brother, as the naked man, and also saying that her nephews have been set up. Uh, hello, is this Merit Zarnev? Yes, speaking. Hi, my name is David Knight. I'm with Infowars.com. Uh, it's Alex Jones's operation. Have you heard of us? Yes, I've heard of you. Yes. And we would very much like to do an interview with you. Would that be possible? Since, since I have seen the material that you presented for the public before about the invasive bombings, even before the names of our boys were put out there, I was following you, you know, from the very beginning. Okay. I don't know. I have trust in that information. I have trust in you. And I would, I would like, I would like to have my word said. Good, good. Especially in the part when the, the guy that is that was uh, taken into custody by police then uh, given over to FBI you know who I'm talking about that, yes. that clip yes yes a naked guy yes I have to I have to publicly state that I confirm and identify this person as my nephew Tamerlan Sarnaev she's obviously a woman in grief uh, she said that uh, she believes that there's a cover-up, that they were set up, but that she has basically run her race, that, 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 that she's not going to fight this anymore. Uh, and I said, is it, is it because of the threats? And she said, no, I have not been threatened. Uh, and if they're listening right now, uh, I'm not going to do anymore. So this is like something out of a movie. And, of course, earlier in the day she had said that she was being threatened, and that was quoted by newspapers uh, around the world. Okay, so we see it right there, and you heard in that video her children playing in the background, so of course somebody who's being threatened doesn't, you know, want to put their children at risk. And we'll talk about what she said a little bit later in the broadcast, talking about how she trusted InfoWars because we actually put out accurate information the best we can. You know, we don't get everything right all the time, but that is our, our mission. So we'll talk about that just a little bit later. But now I want to talk about the conflicting information about the Boston bombing early on, and Leanne McAdoo has that report. So you heard it right there in that, in that special report from Leanne. A lot of inconsistencies even early on, and they do continue. Let's go to this. Boston terror narrative starting to fall apart. This by Zero Hedge. Now, we'll scroll down a little bit. Initially, the claim was that they robbed a 7-Eleven was totally false, as reported by USA Today on April 19th. There was a 7-Eleven robbery in Cambridge last night, but it had nothing, nothing, nothing to do with the Boston Marathon bombing suspects. We'll scroll down a little bit more. The FBI admitted Friday that they interviewed the now deceased Boston bombing suspect Tamlin Zarnayev two years ago, and they failed to find any incriminating evidence. And we'll move down just a little bit further to the other oddities section. According to the head cross-country coach of the University of Mobile, bomb-sniffing dogs and a bomb squad inspected the runners. So, you know, you got a guy saying, a very credible man, I assume he's been to one or two of these things before, the, uh, the track coach. And he says, you know, there were bomb-sniffing dogs around, you know, even though the FBI and other people have tried to deny that that went on. Dan Badandi uh, went up to the area and found people who said similar things. And also, uh, the FBI, keep in mind, when they released the, the footage of the two brothers early on, not placing a bomb, of course, they released footage of these people. We have no idea who they are. We need you to help, help us identify these guys, you know. And, of course, you know, it may be hard for an officer or an agent to recall every single person they've ever come in contact with. But I would think when you say, hey, FBI, these are the guys who are these suspects, you think somebody may go dig through a case file and say, oh, yeah, that's Tamlin, or I know that guy. I've talked to that guy's mom or so forth. But, you know, that's not, of course, what they did. And also the 7-Eleven had nothing to do with the Boston bombing suspects. It's an unfortunate situation, but, yes, it had nothing to do with the Boston bombing suspects. So those are just a few more of the inconsistencies. Now I want to go to this Boston bombers during shootout. We didn't do it. Now if we can just play that in the background for our viewers. And I just want people to see this firefight that's taking place. You can see it right there. And I'm going to read some of the some of the things said by the Boston bombers. At 24 seconds they said, "Chill out, chill out, chill out. We didn't do it. We didn't do it. We didn't do it." Hey officer. 
Now, these guys wouldn't be the first guys to claim that, you know, they were innocent of, you know, per, you know perpetrating any particular crime. There are plenty of people in prison who say the same things. So you'd say, well, why would you say this about these particular gentlemen if they're saying that they didn't commit the crime? Well, let's go to this, our next article. Eyewitnesses, Joe Karzarnayev did not shoot Boston cop. So we'll scroll down just a little bit. Well, actually, it's the, uh, the first paragraph there. Eyewitnesses to the shootout involving the alleged Boston bombers have thrown up another contradiction to the official narrative, asserting that transit police officer Richard H. Donahue Jr. was not shot by Jokar Zarnayev, but by other cops in a friendly fire incident. Now we'll scroll down just a little bit, and it says eyewitnesses to the shootout also contradicted claims by police that Jokar Zarnayev ran over his own brother, stating and said that he was run over by police. Now, you can't take an eyewitness's claim for it, I guess, uh, is the case. And the article points out at the bottom that friendly fire incidents or, you know, just wrongful shooting incidents are not highly uncommon as it talks about uh, things such as the Empire State shooting that left many people injured who were not the intended target. So it's nothing that's uh, highly unlikely for a police officer to miss his target, especially in a pressure situation. Now, I want to go on to this, and what we're going to talk about here the people who are either dead or in jail from these, uh, from these Boston bombing investigations. We'll start with this one. FBI blocks release of autopsy on Boston suspect's pal. Although the autopsy on Tochchev was completed July 8th and ready for release, the FBI has informed the office that the case is still under active investigation and thus not uh, to release the document. So you remember the gentleman right there. He was a, uh, a fighter, an MMA fighter, a boxer, and so forth. And, you know, he comes in contact, or should I say the FBI comes in contact with him and another gentleman. They send, send him down, they say, hey, we got to talk about these, uh, these Boston bombing suspects. They say, okay. And then they tell one of the guys to leave, one of the, the uh, interviewees to leave. And Chochef, and, uh, he said, hey, man, I don't feel comfortable being left alone with these guys. I think they're up to something. And, you know, and the guy's being told to get out by the feds. You know, he really doesn't know what else to do but to get out. So anyway, uh, Mr. Chochef is left alone with the FBI agents. And then the story came out that he lunged at the FBI agents with a knife. Then he had a stick. Then he threw some pixie dust at him. And, but regardless, it ended up he really didn't have anything in his hands, and it really can't be proved that he lunged or attacked these, uh, these agents at all. But yet he's dead, and, you know, the world moves on. Nobody cares about this man is dead without any real information that he committed any type of crime. You know, he just happened to be associated to the, uh, the Boston bombers, the alleged Boston bombers. Let me emphasize that. You know, I don't convict in public opinion like many other news agencies do. And don't forget uh, the two, two accomplices or the alleged accomplices of the younger brother or the, uh, the multiple accomplices, I should say, of the younger brother who ended up in jail over a similar incident. Now, let's go to this. The feds just aren't satisfied with killing other people. You know, they just may happen to end up dead themselves. Two FBI agents involved in Joe Carzarnay's arrest fall out of helicopter and die. Two members of the FBI's elite counterterrorism unit died Friday while practicing how to quickly drop from a helicopter to a ship using a rope. Skip down a little bit. Last month, the team was involved in the arrest of Joe Karzarnayev, a suspect in the Boston Marathon bombing. Now, this reminds me of what happened to one Mr. Terrence Yankee, a Yankee in Oklahoma City. He was a first responder. Maybe he saw some things that he wasn't supposed to see. So he drove out to the sticks, slid his wrist being, a, uh, being anemic, walked a couple miles, hopped over a fence, and then shot himself in the head at a very unusual angle. And I see the same thing with these gentlemen. I had accidents do happen. Now, of course, those things do happen. But uh, these, these FBI agents end up dead. So it's a very unfortunate situation. Now we'll jump to that. That's on your screen right there. We'll talk about the attacks on Alex Jones. And this one is by Salon. Conspiracy theories. Jokar was framed. Now we'll go to the first paragraph to the lower half. Conspiracy theories pushed by conspiracy broadcaster Alex Jones and others who think Zarnayev is a patsy to cover up the fact that the real masterminds of the bombings was the U.S. government. Now, I'm not pointing any fingers at any one particular person, but I do think it's very suspicious that, the, uh, that bomb drills happened that same day as the Boston bombing. You have bomb-sniffing dogs who, for some reason, can't smell a, a bomb that's right over there. Very fishy to me. And also, you know, FBI agents are ending up dead. You're, they're refusing to release uh, footage of them placing the bomb, refusing to uh, release the autopsy uh, documents about Mr. Tochchev. But, you know, you know, you're crazy if you dare 
look at people who have committed such atrocities such as the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, you can go look that up for yourself. That was in the New York Times that the, uh, the Patsy was told to make a real bomb by the FBI that then detonated. Let's move to this. Alex Jones downplays, downplays connection to Boston bomber. He could be a listener, said Alex Jones, and you know, just like the aunt said, yes, they do like to watch the show, listen to the show. We'll scroll down a little bit. Jones said the bombing was one of a number of plots hatched by the FBI, like I just said, the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. He also claimed that Joe Carr's Arnaev throat wound would have been inflicted by the authorities, calling it that special throat surgery they did. So they don't like uh, when you point out the obvious that this man did, you know, he climbs out the boat without a gun. They don't find a go gun in the boat, even though they originally claimed that uh, Mr. Zarnayev had shot himself in the throat somehow, even though he climbs out with a clean t-shirt. Uh, doesn't make any sense to me. And we'll move on to this. Police believe Zarnayev brothers killed officer for his gun. Police now think they have the answer. Investigators now believe that officer Collier was killed because the two Boston bombing suspects wanted to take his gun. Officer Sean Collier was shot in the head execution style while sitting in his patrol car, his patrol unit. And this article does not point out any incriminating evidence that actually points to the two alleged bombers. It just points out the simple fact that Mr. Uh, Mr. Collier was shot in the back of the head during the alleged crime spree of the two uh, perpetrators. And that section right there is just some of the inconsistencies and the things wrong with the official story. You know, people want to believe the official story as their bread and butter, but you're taking it from an agency such as the FBI who does things such as the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. Can't stress that enough because it shows that these people are not without fault. They're not without blood on their hands, not without sins in their, uh, in their stable. So that's that section. I hope you all enjoyed it. But we'll wrap up the news with these two quick stories, uh, but not to say that they're not just as important. Judge refuses to drop charges of aiding the enemy against Manning. That's Officer, uh, excuse me, uh, Army Private Bradley Manning, that is. And it says that uh, he, he aided the enemy, the military judge ruled Thursday morning, leaving open the possibility of life in prison for the admitted source of a major intelligence leak. Now, for those who are not familiar with one private Manning, he uh, was at the center of the WikiLeaks scandal. He released some information, in, which he admits, but, you know, he says, you know, I, I released this, I released that. And, you know, he did release a lot of things, but things such as uh, the helicopter footage of them shooting a man, taking his children to school. They stop in a van to help some injured people, and they get shot at. And uh, things such as that, you can't have the American public knowing about that. So uh, he released some things, but I don't think he was intentionally aiding um, in abetting the enemy, even though the judge uh, apparently doesn't care too much about that. He just wants to see him nailed to the wall. So just like we say, uh, justice for Snowden, justice for Kokesh, I want some justice for Mr. Bradley Manning, and justice means not spending the rest of his life in prison. Now, speaking of a person who may end up spending the rest of their natural life in prison, we have this. Zimmerman trial turned spotlight on another Florida self-defense case. Now. This is one, Marissa Alexander, 32, an African-American woman, was sentenced to a mandatory 20 years in prison for firing a weapon, warning, excuse me, warning shot into the wall of her home in 2010 to end a violent argument with her abusive husband. We'll move on. Under the Stand Your Ground law, people fearing for their lives can use deadly force without having to retreat from confrontation even when it is possible. Alexander, a slightly built woman, said her husband, Rico Gray, was moving toward her threateningly, and then she fired into the kitchen wall. He had previously been convicted on domestic violence charges for attacking her. Keep that in mind. And also, Gray's two children were at home in the living room. Prosecutors alleged that the shot endangered Gray and the children. Well, the shot may endanger Gray himself, the, uh, the alleged uh, perpetrator in this, but the children, you know, it's, it's a soft, uh, sticky situa situation where, you know, I definitely care for the uh, well-being of the children, but what about the woman? You know, uh, they didn't say the children were, were hit by this, it didn't say that the children were grazed by this, so, you know, somebody firing a warning shot against somebody who's been convicted for violent crimes, and that gets 20 years, but lo and behold, you know, something like uh, the Trayvon Martin case, regardless of how you feel about that, a man shoots somebody dead, and now uh, he's walking free and easy. And, and for the record, I don't believe that uh, George Zimmerman was guilty of murder. Uh, I believe murder has to be premeditated, preconceived, with uh, malice of forethought. I think he could have been convicted of something like uh, manslaughter, which could easily carry 
a 20 year sentence as well. But, you know, people want, you know, ah, ah, we got to kill George Zimmerman. You could have easily convicted him of manslaughter, in my personal opinion. So that's it for the news segment. But don't fret, the nightly news is not over yet. We have two power packed interviews one with one Miss uh, Dr. Catherine Albrecht. She's been talking to us about spy chips as well as a major victory in the city of San Antonio, so you don't want to miss that. And also, Gigi Arnett is going to be talking to a witness in the Michael Hastings incident, uh, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's hard to call it a out-and-out -out murder. We don't have su such uh, sufficient evidence for that. But I definitely think there was some foul play involved. You know, people's engines just don't fly down the street and so forth. So stay tuned for that. But first, go to the InfoWars shop and pick up State of Mind. It's our new documentary uh, produced by Free Mind Films. We're the exclusive carrier right now. You can get it in DVD and Blu-ray for $5 extra. It's a great video. Uh, you can watch it on PrisonPlanet.tv if you have a subscription. But if you don't have a subscription to PrisonPlanet.tv, go and pick one up right now. You can get a 15-day free trial. It's great stuff on there. You get the Alex Jones radio show. You get the nightly news, which you're watching right now. You get the rants. The movies, uh, the State of Mind is on there in the movie section. So stay tuned and watch all that. And we'll be back right after this with Dr. Katherine Albrecht. Now you can watch Alex Jones live at Infowars.com forward slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. You can also browse the network, the Infowars Nightly News, and over 60 movies and documentaries all together in one place. You can watch the Alex Jones radio show live as it happens. So check it out, Infowars.com forward slash show. The important thing about the Pro One filter today is that the material we use for removing fluoride and other heavy metals now will remove the latest form of fluoride called hydrofluorosilicic acid. There's no other fluoride reduction filter out there that will remove that type of fluoride. And it's extremely important because Today, we're hearing more and more cities are using that form of fluoride. We've been having medication forced on us through the water system for quite a while. Most people don't realize it. Most people don't realize the negative effects of fluoride. There's a wide range of health effects that are attributed to fluoride. Bottom line, why should somebody get this new Pro One Pro Pure filter? The reason to buy the Pro One, it's an all-in-one filter. It's convenient, easy to use. It doesn't require the add-on fluoride filter, and in addition, this filter removes the latest form of fluoride called hydrofluorosilicic acid. And welcome back. Our guest tonight is Dr. Katherine Albrecht. She's here in the city of Austin to share a key victory she had actually in the city of San Antonio and also give us some new breaking news on StarPage.com. She joins us now in studio. And thank you for joining us, Doctor. Well, thank you, Chikari. It's great to be here. Yes. All right. Now, I like Miss Albrecht. She's, uh, or Mrs., I should say. She's a very lovely woman. She has a great persona, but she's here to talk about some rather serious things. So first of all, Miss Albrecht, tell us why you're in the city of Austin today. Well, I'm actually here to celebrate some good news for a change, and that's always wonderful when that happens. We scored a huge victory this week that the chipping program where they had those microchips on tags around the kids' necks, the pilot tracking program down in San Antonio, Texas, yes. has officially been scrapped. Yes, so high five to everybody out there who fought to make that happen. Uh, we were super excited to hear that they dropped the program. They cited everything from public opposition to poor publicity to the fact that it cost money and didn't do what they had hoped it would do. So you're saying it's been completely scrapped? It has been scrapped. So when those kids go back to school this fall, exactly as we requested of the school board and the administration and everyone else we've spoken to, they're uh, doing what we asked, and there will be no chips around those kids necks this fall. That is great, because I actually had a chance to go down to San Antonio, uh, I guess it was the end of last year, and it was a, uh, a rally at a school board meeting, I believe it was, and you know, we had all the, the school board people up there, and they had 
a chance for the people to speak. You know, people came out for the spy tips, but I believe they only allowed five people to talk for two minutes each or something along those lines. And the room was full of people who were against this program for various reasons, for privacy reasons, for health reasons. And you can see some of the, uh, the footage right there on your screen. But it is exciting to see this has uh, been thrown out. You know, the whole community really opposed it, and of course, um, Andrea Hernandez, the yes. now 16, she was 15 last year, but the 15-year-old honor student who just put her foot down and said, I do not want to wear a tracking badge around my neck, and, you know, she stood firm, as, as you know, she was expelled mm -hmm. from her school, and I believe there's now some talk about her actually going back to the school. So we and want to say great. congratulations. I'm here to congratulate Andrea, here to congratulate the entire state of Texas, really, because mm -hmm. this sets a precedent for the rest of the state. And before we get a little too carried away with our victory, there are some other programs going into place. We know that Carroll, Texas is now looking at RFID or GPS tracking badges for their teachers. Uh, other school districts around the country were looking at San Antonio and saying, oh, well, it's such a success there. Maybe we ought to try it here. We know that the vendors of these programs have approached uh, schools all over the country trying to pitch these programs to them. So we're hoping that with this one setback for the industry, that will maybe send a message to those other schools. And if they don't, then we'll do the same thing. We'll go out and we'll do protests and we'll do community forums and we will petition and, and provide them with all the information they need to decide not to do it. And speaking of that information, Ms. Albert, you know, people may be out there and say, you know, what's the big deal about these kids having these tracking devices? You know, I want my child to be tracked. You know, what's, what's the big deal? What would you say to somebody like that? Well, the, I, I think the worst possible thing that you can do if you have a valuable resource is to put a big beacon on it and tell everybody that it's there. Mm. So if you want to keep your children safe, what you need to realize is that the predators will be the very first people to get on board that technology. And in fact, uh, when I went out and I interviewed kids at the school and I, I spent a lot of time in San Antonio, I actually spoke with a man who counsels sex offenders. Mm -hmm. And he said that he was actually quite concerned that because this technology can't be turned off, these tags can be read from 300 feet through somebody's, you know, if a, if a child's in their bedroom and they have this tag in their backpack, it's possible to drive down the street and determine where the children are, when they're home. Mm -hmm. You can't turn it off. It's on 24 hours a day. It would be easy to track a pattern. You know, they go from school to the bus to wherever else. It will not only track a pattern, but what it lets you do is see through walls. So if, if a predator has staked out a particular child, and that's typically what they do, mm -hmm. then they would be able to tell if the, if the child was home or not. They would be able to, you know, watch the driveway and see if the parents left when the tag, the, the tag signal was still emanating from the home and know if a child was alone or if a child took um, a, a different path through an alleyway or, you know, some place that they wouldn't, be there where there wouldn't be other people around so right. it, it creates a real potential for that and then I actually interviewed a man who has turned over a new leaf but he spent a number of years in jail for that kind of crime mm. and he actually told me on camera that when he was offending he would have used this technology wow. to stalk his victims that's powerful stuff so you know parents we need to think carefully about what seems like it's safe but really creates greater danger for you know, the children in our care. And I think the main thing to keep kids safe, you, you keep an eye on them. You get to know them. You, 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 the teachers need to know the names of the kids in their classroom. And, you know, parents need to be more involved in the community. But the, the, you don't want to abdicate that to an electronic tracking device because it'll backfire. Exactly. Now, if somebody's out there and they're saying, you know, Miss Albrecht, they're trying to do this at my school or in my town, what would you say, you know, what advice can you give them? What resources can you give somebody? Well, I, I would encourage them to contact me because we've had uh, tremendous success in the last 10 years of stopping RFID implementation. And my website, just my name, KatherineAlbrecht.com, I'm pretty easy to find, or KMA at SpyChips.com is my email. I would, anybody who hears about a program like this going into their school, we'd, we definitely want to hear from them. Um, we have managed uh, to stop a lot of things, and, and one, I think probably the main one, is our antichips.com website, which um, shows how we stop the chipping of human beings, and by that I mean the implantation of human beings. Mm -hmm. So back in 2007, the uh, Verichip Corporation, you know, it's gone by many different names, Digital Angel, Verichip, Applied Digital, Digital Solutions, Angel, but you yeah, know the one, yeah. right? The, the, the implant that they said, oh, it'll be the next greatest thing for you know, diabetics, and, and if you're ever in a coma, they can ID you. And they were implanting it into people. Blue Cross Blue Shield was running a trial where they were implanting these into diabetic patients. We had um, Tommy Thompson, former candidate for 
for president. He was the head of the FDA when the FDA approved the device, actually for medical implantation. Mm -hmm. um, he then stepped down from the FDA and took a position on their board of directors for a whole lot of stock. So talk about conflict of interest. Oh, yeah. Uh, we had a program happening in West Palm Beach, Florida, which you can see at antichips.com, our big protest about that, where uh, they were chipping Alzheimer's patients. And talk about a population that can't say no. Yes, you know, exactly. Yeah. If you have Alzheimer's, y you can't consent. You, you can't give meaningful medical consent to something mm -hmm. like that being done to you. So it, it was looking pretty bleak. And in fact, the Verichip Corporation stock was trading at over $10 a share. And it was like the sky was the limit. And we discovered um, that, that these microchips had caused cancer in laboratory animals. That when you put this into an, uh, an animal in a laboratory, between 1 and 10 percent of them develop fast-growing malignant cancerous tumors around the microchip. And when we revealed that story through the Associated Press, all of those programs went poof. They all went away. And the best part was we watched the value of the stock of that company go from over $10 a share to, I think it was like 24 cents a share. Okay. Yeah. They were delisted from the stock exchange, and that was the end of that company. And so that's why we're not hearing a lot about human shipping right now. They removed the chips from the, um, from the Alzheimer's patients. They removed the chips from the diabetics. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, no one is promoting human shipping right now. Yeah, and we've seen that, I believe it was in Europe. Uh, it, they had some real trendy club where the way to get in was you had a the chip. Baja Beach Club. Yeah, yes. oh, so you're yeah. familiar with this. Yeah, in yes. fact, I went to the Baja Beach Club in Rotterdam, uh, the Netherlands, in Holland. And when we got there, and again, it was one of these things where they hyped it up and mm. made it seem like a big deal. But when we got there, they, they had to dust off an old PC that hadn't been plugged in in a year <laughs> to try to fire up the system because it was really a publicity trick. Yeah. So here they were you know, leading you to think that the entire club was filled with chipped patrons, but the reality was they couldn't even, they, they had to go get, they had to send somebody out to the store for batteries for the reader because wow. it had sat in a drawer for so long. So that one also um, went away. And once you actually see these malignant tumors, and, and uh, there's another website I'd like to refer people to, which is chipmenot.com, where we talk about all the animals that have developed tumors. And at Chip Me Not, you can see dogs that have died, bled to death from these chips. And some of these uh, kennels and so forth, it's standard procedure to chip the dogs and the cats. It is. And in fact, uh, I tried not too long ago to adopt a cat from a shelter. And the, the cats are not chipped because it, it's horrifying, but they euthanize them and they don't want to waste a chip. Oh, wow. So if they don't get adopted, they, they don't want to bother chipping them. And I said, this is a lovely cat. I would love to take this cat home. I, is she chipped? And they said, well, no, she isn't, but we'd have to chip her before we gave her to you. And I said, well, I don't want a chipped cat, but I'd like to adopt this cat. And if I don't adopt it, you, you know, the, cat may, the, cat, yeah. the cat's going to die. I said, would you rather this cat die than me get a cat without a chip? And the woman looked me right in the eye and she said, yes. Wow. And I went, okay. They have procedures. So the, the agenda is, is not about saving animals. The agenda is about here's Tracking. the rules and yeah. follow the rules. And, and we want to implement this technology and we want people to accept it whether they want to or not. And that's why, bringing it back again to why I'm here in, in Austin, I'm so excited that we've scored yet another victory on, on the chipping of the kids in San Antonio. Because it really is, people stand up, you get the information about it, this is dangerous, and uh, all the downsides of it. And when people stand up, I'll tell you, these guys wilt. They wilt under pressure. Yeah, they, they want to be bullies. They don't want to get in a real toe-to-toe -to -toe fight. Because they're not, they don't have any courage. I mean, anybody exactly. who'd want to do that to children. You know, I look at what they did to Andrea. They expelled her from her school. Mm -hmm. They persecuted her. They made her go to a separate lunch line. Yeah. I mean, how much worse could it get? They didn't let her vote for homecoming queen. And she couldn't rent library books and uh, get football <laughs> tickets and so forth. I it mean, was completely ridiculous. It is. And you think about a 15-year-old girl. I mean, high school, your, your school and your friends are your life. Mm -hmm. They didn't care. They wanted her out of there. So, you know, and they didn't care how much she suffered. So it's, it's her day in the sun. It is her victory. We're very, very proud of what she's done. And uh, I, I want to say, anybody else want to do this? Bring it on, because I think we've got the public really opposed to this. All right. Now, I know you have other news, and we'll get to that in just one second, yeah. but you brought up the, the human chip, and not just uh, wearing a RFID tag, but right. having the chip in your skin. I know you're a deeply religious, spiritual person. Right. Uh, what are your thoughts about that on the religious aspect? My goodness, um, the, the whole direction that all of this, I think, is going has, has a, a dark component to it. And whether you're a Christian, Muslim, Jew, whatever religion you are, 
when you think about where technology is going, I think you do get the sense of what Alex frequently refers to as like the total enslavement of humanity. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, got a, that's got a dark aspect to it, a spiritual aspect to it. And I don't think that that's accidental. I think that these technologies, the, the drones in our skies, the satellites watching us, the NSA surveilling all of our online activities, and everything right down to the smartphone that's tracking where you go and who mm -hmm. your contacts are, all of that, I think, is, is really putting a noose around all of our necks that at some point is going to be pulled. And as a Christian, I, um, I've, I've told this story many times when I was a little girl. Uh, my grandmother told me about the, the last book of the Bible, Revelation, where there's a prophecy that talks about a time when all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and bond, or enslaved or imprisoned. My grandmother took me aside and told me that there would be a time when people would not be able to buy or sell without a number on their right hand or their forehead. And at that time, back in the 1970s, I had never seen a computer because the computers took up entire city blocks. They mm. weren't little handheld devices. I'd never seen a credit card, believe it or not, because they weren't in use at that time in the wow. 1970s. Yeah, there was a thing called diner's card, but that was about it. And only, you know, people we didn't know had them. Mm. I never knew anybody who had one. And even the cash registers, they weren't hooked up to the internet because there wasn't an internet. They weren't um, high-speed, ubiquitously networked computer systems like they are now. They were just a cash drawer with a calculator on the top, right. and you pushed a button and out. So for me, when my grandmother told me that you wouldn't be able to buy or sell without a number, I couldn't imagine how that would be possible. And, of course, she's referring to the book of Revelation, which is the last book of the Bible. The mm -hmm. easy way to remember where this is is the last book of the Bible because it's about the end. Oh, right. And then you go to chapter 13, which is kind of an unlucky number, mm -hmm. and then go to the very end of there. And verses 16 through 18 talk about a time when all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and bond, or imprisoned or enslaved, mm -hmm. will be caused to have this mark on their right hand or their forehead. And without it, they won't be able to buy or sell. And to get the mark, they'll have to bow down and, and worship the political and religious power of that end time, which is truly the, the power of darkness. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that's what we refer to as the beast of the end time. And the Bible is uh, extremely clear that the people who take the mark will have two punishments. There's a physical punishment. They'll actually have a noisome and grievous sore. And the word noisome means festering and hideous. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, when I looked at the pictures of those cancer, oh, yeah. those cancerous tumors around those microchips, which, by the way, you can see if you go to uh, chipmenot.com and click on some of the, the rat and mouse story. I mean, that's horrifying. And so the, it says that a noisome and grievous sore is, is um, the physical outcome. And then the spiritual outcome is to be forever within the wrath of God. And it talks about how... Um, you know, their, the, the wrath of their torment, well, the smoke of the wrath of their torment rises forever. That doesn't sound good to me. No. So the, the, the Bible's pretty clear that the one thing you really want to not do is take that, that mark of the beast. Yeah. So I, at the age of, you know, eight or nine, when my grandmother told me this, I said, I can't imagine this is ever going to happen in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. So I'll pass it on to my kids and their grandkids will pass it on to their And some year, someday, thousands of years when this happens, my descendants, my distant descendants will know not to do it. And then there I was in uh, 1999. And I, my grandmother had long since passed away and I'd kind of forgotten all about it. And then something started kind of making me remember. And it was the mobile speed pass. You oh, yes. The, you, you, the little number. And I was thinking, wait a minute, you can wave it. And then I looked and I... Uh, did a little research and I found that they had a wristband version of it, a, a wristwatch version. So you could just swipe your right hand and right. make a payment. And that's kind of how all of this, um, how all of this started unfolding for me as I became very interested in the ways that people were buying and selling with numbers. That of course leads you into privacy invasion and databases and mm -hmm. recording of people's purchases. And then that of course leads you into political control and, and control of food and markets. Right. So it really is a, a big picture. And the way I like to describe it on, on my radio show is I, I refer to it as, you know, we're all working on different pieces. Some people are working on, you know, Monsanto and genetically modified foods. Other people are working on vaccine issues or, or working on, um, you know, government control or the Federal Reserve. And it feels like we're all kind of doing our own little different things. Mm -hmm. But when you put it all together, what you begin to discover is all those things are spokes on a wheel. And they're all converging. They're all heading towards a central point of convergence. That's right. And when that convergence occurs, um, you can see it as a good thing or a bad thing. I see it as a very bad thing. 
There are other people who call it, uh, like Ray Kurzweil, calls it the singularity, singularity. right? right yeah. So the point at which everything comes together and humanity breaks free of this, this package flesh. of meat yeah. and becomes one with the machine and we all just become bits and bytes and zeros and ones. And then we have a, a immortality. We never have to die. We upload our memories into the machine. Yeah, but you can't upload your soul. You can't. And I actually think that this whole Mark of the Beast thing, that that, that may be what it entails. Somehow to say, I surrender the essence of who I am into this board, this thing, mm -hmm. this thing. And, you know, I, I, I've talked often about, um, you know, the web, there's a, where there's a web, there's a spider hmm. or the net. Where there's a net, there's a predator and there's prey. Right, and yeah. we have built all around the globe, we have built a web and a net. And it's really, as I said earlier about the, the news, it's just a question of pulling it tight. So, you know, what do you do about that? Uh, I think there's a lot of things you can do. You can make practical solutions, like Start Page, which we'll be talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, you can make political solutions, vote for people who don't follow this sort of thing, or go to protest meetings, or, or go to board meetings and try to get things changed. And I think fundamentally, though, that, that given that it's a spiritual battle, there really is only a, a spiritual answer. And that answer, as far as I'm concerned, is the saving blood of Jesus Christ. So, you know, when you feel a predator coming, and I've, I, talk, I travel all the time, I talk to people on the plane, of all different faiths and backgrounds and religions, and I don't, I try not to proselytize, I mean, I, you know, but, but when I talk to people, the one thing I can say to everybody, and they all go, uh-huh, is I say, don't you feel something coming for us? And they all go, hmm, and I say, don't you feel like all this yeah. technology is maybe going in a dark direction? And even the people who, like, they're on Facebook all day long, they're like, kind of, yeah, I know what you mean. And then I say, well, that thing that's coming for us wants to eat us. Mm -hmm. It wants to eat humanity. And it wants to eat you. And the only way that you're going to be able to escape it is not going to be all the survival food in the world. I totally believe in that. I think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. But it's not going to be arming yourself to the teeth. It's not going to be any of that. It, it really is that the only thing that's going to save you is going to be getting on your knees and saying, Lord, just cover me in your blood because that's what protects me. Right, because we see this, uh, I did a speech, well, I didn't do a speech, Alex did a speech that I had a chance to film, and he goes out from this audience, he says, you know, they're using the book of Revelations as an instruction manual, meaning I'll the powers, the powers that be, you know, you know the, the chips and all the other tracking and so forth, just because you made a great point, and we'll move on to your, your start page news here, but, you know, uh, you know, a thousand years ago, back, you know, even before that, when the Bible was written, you know, and people were trying to figure out, you know, how, how is all this going to happen, you know? Uh, all these great prophets and, right. and priests and you know, trying to figure out, you know, how can this possibly be implemented? But now we see uh, the smart shopper cards, the RFID chips, right. uh, the cashless society. They don't want to use cash. You know, I see the, the MasterCard commercials or whatever. Oh. The person goes to pay with cash and everybody stuff. Because you know, they're trying to demonize cash. They're trying to make cash uncool and they're trying to make this hip. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if you, um, I'm, I'm sure you talked about it, when Regina Dugan of DARPA, who is now working for Google as the mm -hmm. head of Motorola, yeah. when she demoed that electronic tattoo, oh, yes. and, and she said in that talk, she said, well, it's kind of hard to get young people to wear a wristwatch. But, well, we can, get them, but we can get them to wear a tattoo well, she also if for no about other reason that it's going to upset their parents. Right. And so she's drawing on the cool, the hip, the rebellion to make people trackable. Yes. You would think if you're, gonna, if you're gonna be young and you're gonna rebel, you're gonna rebel against the tracking, but they're trying to make it cool and hip so that you embrace it. It's trendy. Now, mm -hmm. I was gonna ask you, was that the same one who wanted to link your phone to a pill that was swallowed? Yes. Yes. You got yes. it, absolutely. So right, as soon as she demos the electronic tattoo on, on her arm, she then says, oh, but you know, the, the next step is you swallow your authentication. She holds out this pill. And I felt like I was looking at Jack and the Beanstalk, like what? Yes. And, and you, you swallow the pill and it goes through your body. It, it reacts with the acids in your stomach to create a, an electronic signal, an electrical impulse. Why would um, anybody impulse. do that? And the, th the phrase that she said is your arms become antennas and your hands become alligator clips. And everything you touch is, is basically interacting with this number. So your whole, you're not just transmitting a number with your phone, mm -hmm. your whole body from your face to your hands, every piece of your flesh is transmitting this number. It's like the Matrix. Woo! 
It's crazy. That is crazy. Now, I know we have yeah. we covered a lot of things, <laughs> but we have some breaking news out of Start Page Ooh. that we're right. debuting get, right uh, here. Good news. I got, I got to keep news. coming back to the good news, Jakari, because right. otherwise I get discouraged. All right. So our good news is um, today, breaking news, and this is the first place we've revealed this. Oh, thank you. Is that Start Page and Ixquick, the world's most private search engines, have just implemented the most secure form of encryption technology available today. And this is uh, a first. There's no other private search engine that is using this. And in order to understand it, it's actually called Perfect Forward Secrecy. And secrecy. I thought you'd, I thought you'd like that name. Okay. I thought you'd like that. So the way it works is uh, we, since the TSA scandal broke, and Edward Snowden, my hero. NSA. Um, NSA, uh, NSA, yeah, TSA's got They're, its own got scandals. Their own scandals <laughs> to worry about. Yeah, since the NSA scandal broke, and Ed Snowden uh, revealed to us how much, it's, it's kind of like a vacuum cleaner over there at the NSA. They're just scarfing up all our information. That created a, a new concern about encryption. So the way encryption works is if I'm going to send a message to you, I encrypt the message, you decrypt the message, and everybody in between just sees gobbledygook except for you and me. So if the NSA were to intercept an encrypted message, they would just get a bunch of junk. Well, what they're doing with that is they're storing all the bunch of encrypted junk in hopes that they will later be able to get the, the, the key mm -hmm. in order to decrypt it. Well, if they get that key, here's the part that is the security issue. If they get the key for one of the messages, they get the key for all of them. Wow. So what, what um, our new system, Perfect Forward Secrecy, does is instead of creating one key for every single message over weeks and months and years, is we create a new key for every that gets sent. And you can liken it, probably the best way to understand this is if I have a skeleton key or a master key for a building and I'm mm -hmm. the janitor, I can take that key and I can go to any single door in the building and I can pop open everything. Mm -hmm. That's what an encryption key is like. Very hard to get a hold of. You'd have to hit the janitor over the head to right. get it, but once you had it, then you could do whatever you wanted. And in the case of encryption, it's even harder than hitting the janitor over the head. You would have to do you know, some kind of an attack. You would have to um, use a whole lot of computing resources to brute force it open, which could take months, years, it could take a long time. But once you got it, then it kind of unlocks everything. So what we've done is understanding this in light of the fact that they're capturing everything, mm -hmm. is we've switched over to, to the perfect forward secrecy. <clears throat> and what it is like is instead of the master key, it's like every single lock to every single room and every file cabinet has its own individual lock and key. So it provides an additional layer of security. And StartPage, of course, was the first search engine to ever implement SSL encryption in the first place, back in 2011. We mm -hmm. made it the default. So we've been encrypting your searches all along. And the good news is that Edward Snowden, you know, when these revelations broke, we were all like, oh my gosh, has the NSA broken encryption? Can they yeah. read SSL encryption? Mm -hmm. And so the whole security community, we were all leaning forward. What's he going to tell us? Because if the NSA had broken it, he would have told us. Mm -hmm. And what I love about it is, actually, we can see the quote here. He actually says, encryption works. And when I read that, I was like, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So encryption works, properly implemented, I'm quoting Edward Snowden here, mm -hmm. properly implemented strong crypto systems are one of the few things that you can rely on. So there's the key. And then he goes on, and we should know this other part, too. Endpoint security is so terrifically weak that the NSA can find ways around it. Now, that's not start page. That's your laptop. That's your PC. And so the way, if the NSA wants to figure out what you're doing online, they're not going to try to break the encryption. I mean, that's like years worth of effort, and all they get is your one message, so right. why bother? Mm -hmm. What they would instead do is do an attack against you to compromise your personal computer. And then everything you do on the computer, if you're going to read the message, you have to decrypt it first. Mm -hmm. And once it's decrypted, they're just sitting on your computer watching everything. So the solution to that is, is really going to have to be people being much more careful about not visiting malware and phishing sites and mm -hmm. the seamier underside of the internet. And you kind of know when you're there. You know, you right. get pop-ups and creepy stuff. That's a bad sign. Mm -hmm. um, and also to have an up-to-date virus checking program and run it all the time. Like every time you think of it, just go click, run, and, and have it updated regularly so that if there is a virus on there, you can get rid of it. And, you know, ultimately, we may wind up with, you know, the, the computer for the private stuff we do and then the other computer. Yeah, for everything know? else. Yeah. It, it may come down to that. But um, the other thing, I, I would say Linux 
is a much more secure operating system than Internet Explorer, for example. Okay. Uh, we know that Microsoft, which makes Internet Explorer and the Windows operating system, we know that they are in bed with the NSA. They were yeah, they're in the, the PRISM scandal. They are part of the PRISM scandal. Uh, a lot of stuff coming up about what they may or may not have shared or access that they've provided to even people's operating systems and computers. And not to mention they have the new Xbox that, you know, tracks you what, you, what you do. It's so advanced it can tell if you're enjoying okay. the game. And who looks at that and goes, yeah, can't Those wait to get it. Out. They're sold oh out at GameStop. They're sold well, out at GameStop. And, and that means we just need to work harder to educate people. And let me tell you the other thing. We need to make, like, the private Xbox. Because... People put up with the tracking because they want the Xbox. It's mm -hmm. the same when you when you perform a search on Bing or Google or Yahoo. You're putting up with the tracking not because you're like, oh yeah, I don't care if those guys know. No, you want the search results. Right. So that's why with Start Page, we we actually got actual Google results because people wanted them. Mm -hmm. And you know, if it's a toss up, my privacy Google results, my privacy Google results. A lot of people go Google results. Mm -hmm. You know, my privacy Xbox. A lot of people go. Xbox. Xbox. So the solution to that, I think, is that those of us with, with technological skills and security backgrounds who care about these things, people who run businesses, people who write software, we need to be creating sort of almost like an alternative whole world. You know? Yeah. <laughs> like, like we've got Start Page and Next Week, the alternative search engine. We're coming out with Start Mail at startmail.com, which will be the alternative to, you know, Yahoo Mail and, and Gmail and all those services. But we need that for everything. You know, video games. Cable yes, companies, everything. phones, you know, uh, operating systems and, and browsers and, you know, everything. And the list even goes on beyond that. You know, you look at, at supermarket cards. Can I celebrate one more victory with you? Oh, please. All right. So my very first protest ever was in 2002. And it was right here in Texas. It was at the Dallas Albertsons. And we protested their introduction of frequent shopper cards. I have one with a fake name. I'll throw it out there. If you, have you ever used a credit card with it or an ATM no. card? Cash. Only cash. cash. Well, you're one of the rare, it's not you're one of the, real, the rare well, ones. I, I, I don't want to reveal so it too much. Pitch it every once in a recycle that mm -hmm. periodically. But here's the good news you don't need it at Albertsons anymore. You don't need it at Acme, Albertsons, Osco, Shaw's, and there's one other one. But for, all of those chains owned by Albertsons just this last month decided to scrap the cards. So 10 years later, it took 10 years, yes. but we even scored a victory there. And I think one of the reasons we're scoring these, these awesome victories really is due to Ed Snowden. You know, the tide's turned. Now the privacy story is not buried on page 15 and nobody mm -hmm. knows. It's, it's front page. Like oh, yeah. the story that just, that just came out from the ACLU about the tracking of the driver's license, or the license plates. Mm -hmm. I could have talked about that two years ago, and it would have been, you know, nobody would have even noticed. Right. But now it was the front page story on USA Today. And there's another big story out of Colorado. They they now license, or they're considering licensing bounty hunters to go shoot drones. I don't think they're going to do too well, but, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's it got the to the climate. point where people, yeah, people are interested in talking about these the things. The climate, it's like everybody now is kind of waking up and smelling the coffee that's been mm -hmm. brewing all around us for the last 10 years. And I'm actually optimistic. I've been doing this since 1999. I've been at this for 14 years. And this is the first time that I really feel like all those years I spent shouting from the rooftops into the wind mm -hmm. that people are actually now hearing it and waking up. Oh, yes. And I think it's, it's part of a couple things. It's, it's, it's we feel the oppressive hand of government violating our, our constitutional rights and our right. Fourth Amendment rights. I think it's also the other thing I was talking about. We kind of feel something, something's just not right. We're feeling uneasy. Something dark is coming. Uh, I, I think it's also we're feeling empowered because we've got these tools. So it really is going to be, I think, um, you know, a, 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 an informational arms race that we're going to have to use these awesome tools at our disposal that let all of the viewing audience see this conversation. Yes. We have the First Amendment right to have this conversation. Both of us get to go home tonight and not be worried about a black sedan disappearing us or assassinating us because we dared to speak out. So while we still have our First Amendment liberties of the press and speech, and while we still have the tools through which to organize and speak, this is the moment. And I think it's going to be a, a brief blip in history. I think that this moment is not going to last very long. And we have to take advantage of it. Because what's coming next, and of course you know this better than anyone because you're here with InfoWars, and yeah. Alex gets this, and uh, probably more than anybody, is they are putting the pieces in place to shut down the Internet, oh, yeah. to shut down our travel, to shut down our ability to, to gather and speak to one another. And all those little pieces are marching into place. So during this period right now, every single person hearing this interview 
has the ability to pick up the phone and call 50 other people all over the country and say, turn on, you know, turn on the, pull up this browser, go, go watch this interview. Mm -hmm. And in five or ten years, you may not have that ability. So now is the time. Now is the time. And I encourage people, you know, watch this show every day. Listen to what Alex has to say. Yeah, listen Tune to, to my radio some good show. things to say. No, really. There, there are people out there who are telling you the truth and, and telling you what to, what to look for. And I don't know how much longer we'll be able to do it. That's exactly so, right. Now, Miss Oliver, we're about to the end of our interview. So if you give us our final thoughts, if you can look in that camera right there, <clears> and just tell us what they need to know about Catherine Albrecht and what they need to know about the security and privacy of our nation. Terrific. So I, my website is kmashow.com, or just my name, katherinealbrecht.com. If you are using the Internet, and that's pretty much everybody out there, you should be using startpage.com as your, your browser. You can make it your home page. Uh, we've done a, a special video showing you how to do that. Uh, you can also add it to your browser, so it's in the upper right-hand corner, the little pull-down menu up there, so you can always have it available. And I, I think the key thing, pull out of Yahoo, Google, Bing, all the big services, all the PRISM services, find alternatives, and um, you know, just, just keep staying informed. All right. Yeah. Dr. Catherine Albrecht, thank you so much for coming in. We definitely appreciate you. And I believe you do have some other things scheduled for this evening. I do. I'm excited. I'm going to Brave New Books in uh, Austin on Guadalupe Parkway, right across from the UT Austin campus to celebrate. We've got a big party planned tonight. Andrea Hernandez is going to be there. And we're going to be uh, singing for She's a Jolly Good Fellow at the okay. end of that tracking program. So lots of fun tonight. And I hope the folks in Austin are able to turn out and join us. All right. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Jakari. Now, Ms. Albrecht also has a short tutorial that's going to show you how to set up StartPage as your homepage and also how to set up the StartPage browser icon. So stay tuned right after this break. She's going to break down all that information for you. And after that, stay tuned for Gigi Arnetta in her interview with a Michael Hastings witness. Now you can watch the InfoWars nightly news streaming live as it happens for free. Check it out at InfoWars.com forward slash show. John Johnny Appleseed was born during the Revolutionary War. He's not just a legend. And in more than five states, he introduced apples that had not even been grown in the colonies. Later, the seeds from plants he planted and cultivated and some of the varieties he developed spread across the United States. And it was Johnny Appleseed teaching the colonists and then the new Americans after we won independence the love of planting fruit trees that introduced that idea to North America. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a revolutionary act to unplug from the television, to unplug from the computer and all the globalist propaganda and to go out in your backyard or your front yard or planters at your apartment or on the roof of the building where you live and to plant a garden. Become the Johnny Appleseed of your community with seeds from the InfoWars Seed Center at InfoWarsStore.com. The simple act of planting fruits and vegetables and then tending them and taking care of them and then sharing them with friends and family is a revolutionary act against tyranny. The globalists, first and foremost, do not want us to be self-sufficient. The crony anti-free market capitalist, the fascist, are using socialism and collectivism to shut down societies. Stalin in Poland and in Ukraine and other areas starved on record more than 10 million people over five years by not letting them grow their own crops and collectivizing them. Mao killed between 65 million and 80 plus million people doing this same thing. The UN says they will use food as a weapon. They use genetic evil to attack the earth and major GMO companies have been caught going into growth belts around the world, even where GMO is illegal, and planting seeds everywhere to infect the genetics of the original crops. Almost all of the thousands of varieties of Mexican corn has been infected. They are in a genetic war against everyone. That's why we have to get these seeds and not just plant them on our own gardens and not just give them as gifts to friends and family to plant spring and summer and fall gardens. I'm calling on you to go out into the green belts, to go out into the areas and plant secret gardens. 
No, not of marijuana, but of the hundreds and hundreds of incredible high quality uh, vegetables and herbs and fruit plants that are here. Lemons and oranges, the list goes on and on. They will grow, uh, plum trees, grape trees, they will grow almost everywhere in the U.S. We can literally, not just buying these products from InfoWarsStore.com, but from wherever you get them. This aggressive program literally just came to me one morning when I woke up about 4 a.m. realizing that we've got to counter their genetic war against us with original, real crops developed over eons on this planet. We have the lowest prices we bought it in the biggest bulk that some of these companies have ever seen to ship this directly to you from the InfoWars Command Center. We stand for life. We stand for liberty. We stand for self-sufficiency. Go to InfoWarsStore.com, click on the Seed Center, and as of taping this, we have the seven top respected brands. We intend to continue to do research and find other companies, other specialties, other varieties to really take action. The InfoWars Store Seed Center has the largest online selection of heirloom, non-GMO seeds. Check out these products from our newest supplier, Heirloom Organics. The Medicine Garden for a natural remedy. The Tea Garden that contains every important tea herb you can grow. Fruit lovers with 12 varieties. And the Tobacco Pack, additive and pesticide free. Join the gardening revolution today at InfoWarsStore.com. This is a revolutionary action we're asking you to take. Plant seeds everywhere today. Nurture them, bring them to fruit, and pass on the knowledge to others. Become human again. Discover your roots in the soil. And remember, the revolution against tyranny is growing. <laughs> I'm Dr. Katherine Albrecht, privacy expert and also one of the people who helped to create the Start Page search engine. In light of everything we've learned about the NSA and all the spying they've been doing on all of our web searches, it's more important now than ever to begin switching away from Yahoo or Bing or Google, whatever search engine you might be using that's spying on you, and instead switch to the world's most private search engine, startpage.com. So I'm going to talk to you today about how to add Startpage to your browser and how to make it your home page so you can get more Startpage and less Big Brother. Here we go. So if you're like most people, when you turn on your browser, whether it's Firefox, Internet Explorer, or Safari, you're probably looking at a screen that looks a lot like this. Google is set as the home page on most people's browsers, and we can change that. So let me tell you how you do it. First thing you want to do is from your Google window, go ahead and type in Start Page. Doesn't matter, upper or lower case, doesn't matter. We'll just type it in and hit Enter. And you see now that I've got the Start Page web search right there at the top, startpage.com. And now I'm on the Start Page homepage. But if I close the browser and reopen it, it's going to go back to Google. So let's see how I can switch so that when I first open my browser, the home page is actually Start Page. So if you look underneath the search window, this is the search window just like Google. You can search right there. And underneath, see where it says Set as Home Page? Go ahead and click that. And what it's going to do is take you to this page, get more start page, make start page your home page. So every time you open your browser, it defaults to start page. And you'll see right here, it says click here to make this your home page. So we'll click that. And that brings up a set of instructions. Now, depending on which browser you're using, these instructions may vary. But I'm going to show you the instructions for Firefox, which is what we have right now. So I'm going to scoot this over to give myself a little room. And now let me follow the instructions. To set your home page in Firefox, click on the Firefox menu. Now that is up here in this upper left hand corner. Now it says select preferences. We'll pick that. And now it says click on the general tab. See it's right there at the beginning. We click that and it takes us to this page. This is the startup options page so that every time when you start Firefox, this tells Firefox what to do. So it says start up here. When Firefox starts, show my home page. That's good. And now you see that the home page is set to Google. Now on your browser, it may be set to something else. Whatever it is, it's the thing you first see when you open your browser. Now we're going to follow our instructions here. Click on the general tab. We do that. Delete existing address in the home page box and replace it with this. Now I can either, well, I can't 
I think I can just type that in. So what I'm going to do over here, I'm going to select Google, highlight it, hit the delete key on your keyboard so it goes away. That's just a placeholder there. And now I'm going to type www.startpage.com. Double check, make sure you spelled it right. And if you did, hit enter. And you just changed your home page to start page. So now I go up. I'm done with this window of instructions. Close that. And I'm done with this page too. Close this. And now you can test it by going over here to the little house button, the home page button. And when I click that, it takes me to start page. Now every time I close Firefox and reopen it, or Internet Explorer, whatever my browser is, the first thing I'll see when I get there is Start Page. So that's a great start, setting it as your home page. Now let me show you something else. Let's say that you're on a different page on the Internet and you want to do a quick search. Well, you'll notice up here in the top right-hand corner of your browser, there's a pull-down menu of options for various searches. Let's pull that down and see what's available. It defaults to Google. Google actually pays to be up there. So when you pull it down, you could change that default to Yahoo by just clicking it, or you could change it to Bing by just clicking it. The only problem with that is we know that Google, Yahoo, and Bing are three of the nine companies that were involved in the NSA PRISM spying program. So by searching through Bing, Yahoo, Google, any of those search engines, you're potentially sending a copy of your search and all the things that you look for, not only to that company which stores it, but also to the NSA. And if you're concerned about that for privacy reasons like I am, let's see how we can change it so that that's not the option up there. So I'm going to come down here again, right where I saw set his home page, but this time I'm going to do Add to Firefox. And when I click that, it takes me to another page, Get More Start Page, Add Start Page to your browser. This tells me how I can make it so that Start Page is one of those pull-down choices up there. Now I have two choices, HTTPS. That little S means secure or encrypted or HTTP, which is not secure and not encrypted. And I strongly recommend that you go with the encrypted version. So we'll go ahead and click Install. And that pops up this little window, Add Start Page HTTPS, in other words, the secure encrypted connection, to the list of engines available in the search bar. And I do want to do that. I want to start using it right away. And now I'm going to click Add. And now notice what happened in this corner, Start Page is now my default. So no matter where I go on the internet, I can always do a quick Start Page search without having to go all the way back to the Start Page home page. I can still go back to the home page here, and I can still perform a search, or I can type my search up here now. So now let's do a search. Let's look up InfoWars. So what StartPage just instantly did was took the, the question InfoWars, or took the search term InfoWars, submitted it to Google from our servers, not from the servers here, got the answers from Google, stripped out any tracking cookies, and then served them to you completely privately. And now you can click on one of these links. When you do, you'll be leaving StartPage and just regularly surfing the internet. So let's do that. We'll click on InfoWars. So I head on over to the InfoWars website. And now if we want to perform a search from here, we can go up into this corner and do a search. So let's say I'm looking here and I'm interested in, oh, let's find one, the TSA. So let's look up the TSA. I'm going to come up here to start page HTTPS in the corner, that little search box that's in your browser, and I'm going to type in TSA. There we go. Now, when I get the TSA, let's find which one is the actual transportation Secure, there we go, there's the .gov version right here, tsa.gov. Now there's a really cool feature that StartPage offers and Xquick offers that no other search engine has, and you're going to love this. So if I were to click on that Transportation Security Administration link, I would be going directly to a government website. And it is possible that when I got to that government website, in fact it's not possible, it's the case, that they would then see my IP address, they could read tracking cookies or place tracking cookies on my browser. And for some of the senior areas of the internet, they also could have malware, spyware, or other things on them. So I can either click directly, leaving Start Pages Protection, and go to the TSA website, or what I could do 
is click this link and view it through the proxy. So watch what happens. I'm going to click it regular. Now I'm on the TSA. They just put cookies on my browser. They just noted my IP address. They know who I am, where I'm coming in from, and maybe that's not so great. So let's go back and see what I could have done instead for this particular website. Right underneath the link, do you see where it says view by Xquick proxy? Well, that says open the search result anonymously. Now it's a little slower, and I'm going to click it. Let me tell you what happens now. So I'm going to click this link. And now Start Page is going to the TSA server, grabbing the information from the TSA, putting it on a Start Page server, and then I'm now connecting to Start Page. So the TSA only sees a Start Page server. They don't know who you are. If they tried to put a cookie on your browser, it, it, they couldn't because they're not connecting with your browser directly. We're serving as an intermediary or a filter between you and, and the TSA. And once you're on this page, you can go ahead and click Links. And as long as you see up at the top this blue window that says Start Page Proxy, you're in complete privacy. No one can see you. Your ISP itself, whether you have Verizon or Comcast or whatever company uh, provides you with your internet service, normally they get a copy of all your browsing. They get to see every website you go to. But when you're searching through Start Page's proxy, even they don't see it. They just see an encrypted bunch of gobbledygook. So if you spend an hour on Start Page, Searching with the proxy, your ISP would not know where you went. The websites that you visit wouldn't know who you were or who had been on their website. You would pick up no tracking cookies, no malware or spyware. And at the end, when, when you then leave our website, all records of your visit would be deleted from our servers as well. So not only does Start Page let you search anonymously and privately, it even lets you view sensitive websites through a proxy so that even the websites don't see you. So let me just show you. On the TSA website, let's say I want to look at, oh, I don't know, about TSA. I can click here and notice Start Page is going over to the TSA and loading the page for you. So sometimes this will be a little bit slower because we've got to get all of their information. And if this is either Flash or um, JavaScript or something that actually wants to directly interact with your browser, we've determined that that's actually a, a potential security risk. So we block certain things. So I wouldn't use the proxy every day. I don't use it all the time. I only use it when there's something, for example, um, when I was searching for information about cancer and I wanted to go to um, the National Institutes of Health website. I don't want to connect with them and mention cancer. The whole world's going to know that. So instead, I use the Start Page proxy. I was able to load that information privately and view it, and then when I was done, to know that no record had been made of my search. All right, so we're viewing the, the TSA page through Start Page's proxy. TSA doesn't see us, and Start Page makes no record of my having been here. My ISP can't see it. No one can eavesdrop on the connection. So if someone were maybe a hacker, a Wi-Fi hacker, you're in a coffee shop and they try to, tra to access the stream to see what you're doing, they wouldn't be able to see anything but encrypted cobbledygook. So now I'm going to go back up here, click my home page link, and I'm right back to Start Page ready to search in complete and total privacy. So this is why we call startpage.com the world's most private search engine. I'm Gigi Arnetta reporting for InfoWars Nightly News and today I have a witness that was not necessarily at the scene of the Michael Hastings accident, but at the scene after it happened. So thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you. I really wanted to ask you some questions about the crime scene and what you were able to see. I understand that you were inside the house because you were not allowed to be outside, that the police made you stay in the house. Can you tell, a little, tell us a little bit about that? Well, we were at the scene uh, right when it happened, right after the impact, because we were woken up. It was right in front of our house. And we were outside up until uh, the coroner got into, see, uh, into the scene. And then at that point, we were asked to go inside. So I went inside and I uh, then went on my balcony which uh, was facing the scene and they asked me to go away from my balcony into the house 
so I was able to observe it from the window. Which is actually a, a pretty decent view, right? Because you're above everything. It, it, yes, exactly. It was a good view. They were trying to spread the white linens from the coroner's van to block my view. But nevertheless, I had the corner where I could see pretty much everything. Okay, well, let's, let's start from the beginning. You were asleep when it happened. What did it sound like? And was there any light coming through the windows? Okay, so my uh, bedroom window facing the scene, and my bed is right, right under that window. So I was woken up for, uh, with the loud uh, bang or boom, simultaneously with the big flush, huge flush, to the point that my whole room was like a daylight even though through the, through the heavy curtains. So before I even got off the bed, I moved the curtain and I saw the what I assumed was the car. I couldn't even see if it was a car, but I assumed it was the car completely engulfed in flames. So you heard, you heard a sound that sounded like a boom. Did it shake the house at all? Not that I remember, no. It did not shake the house. It was a boom and flash. And we both, me and my husband, jumped off the bed. He put on his slippers and ran downstairs um, and screamed to me, uh, call 911. And uh, he, by the time I put on my rope and came out uh, while dialing 911, he was already uh, turned on the hose and was trying to put the flames down. So when you heard the boom, how? You jumped out of the bed, so it was just a few seconds, and you went to the window. It was already on fire, right? It was on fire uh, simultaneously with the impact. Okay. And how big would you say that fire was? As big as you see it on all the uh, videos that you see on the YouTube and everywhere. Uh, it was like this from the start. It started like that. Okay. So really instantaneously there was a fire? Instant. Okay. And then as time passed, how long did it take for the fire department and the police to get there? From my call to the fire uh, department, it was between three and four minutes. Okay, which is pretty fast in LA. Very fast. I think it's five minutes. And uh, so maybe tops five minutes. What was the first thing that they did when they got there? Uh, the first the, one of the fires, uh, well, while they were unpacking the equipment, unrolling the hoses, one a fireman looked into the driver's side. And they, you even could see him on the videos where he's just uh, like kind of looking at it, uh, resigned, seeing that there's no rush, uh, that whoever is there, uh, it's too late to save him. And therefore, at that point, they were, there was no uh, rush in their movements. They, I mean, they were putting out the fire and it took them about 30 seconds of their hoses uh, with the pressure that they have to put it out. But they were not, they, they saw that they were not saving anybody. Did you see anything in the car at that point? Could you see from your view? You could absolutely could not see. In fact, when I called 911, they asked me, do you see people in the car? And I said, no, there is, I cannot see anything in the car. I can see the car itself. It was a ball of flame. And, and so when the police got there and the, and the firemen were there, they were trying to put the fire out. Tell us a little bit about when the coroner got there. Okay, the coroner got there at 7.30. That was three hours after the accident. And the coroner, uh, there were two cars. There was a regular car and a van. There were two lady coroners. Um, one of them was coroner investigator, another just coroner. There were signs on their backs. Uh, one Korean, I assumed, Oriental, and one uh, Latina. And there were like slight ladies, so I was just thinking, my God, how are they going to go ahead with this task? Right. And. Um, at that point, um, there was a fire department on the scene, but not the one that put out the fire. It was another fire uh, department that was uh, that had equipment to cut the cars with the jaws of life and uh, chains and all kind of stuff like that. 
and um, what they did was they first cut out um, they had the, I think they had the generator with them they plugged in the electric uh, tools they cut out the car um, I think the whatever was left of the front bumper and the back and the all side panel of uh, the, from the driver's side then they chained the front of the car to the palm tree, the back of the car to the fire truck. Right. They backed the fire truck to unfold the car like accordion. Mm -hmm. And then they uh, got to get him out. So two firemen got him out. And at that point, um, the coroners took over the body. Okay, so back to getting the jaws of life out you said they had to basically saw into the car what when the fire was finally put out and, I, and I'm guessing they got it completely out before they started to oh, no, no okay so 4 30 is 4 20 4 30 is the accident the car uh, five minutes later they only seen the, the fires put out within 30 seconds so by 4.35, the fire was out. Now we're talking coroner on the scene at 7.33 hours later. The body was in the car without any fire for three hours. <laughs> for three, at least three hours, a bunch of uh, police cars and the detective and the supervisor of the police were all around the block uh, measuring, uh, taping, um, uh, taking pictures, taking videos. There was a separate photographer from the police, uh, designated by the police photographer, taking all kinds of pictures from all kinds of angles. Uh, there was a detective who was not in a police uniform there uh, supervising the whole thing. There was a supervisor of the police force in the police uniform supervising the policemen. Uh, so it was. Uh, for three hours they were working on that before they even touched the body. Now when you were looking at this whole scene there was a lot of debris. I know I saw it in the videos. Orla. How yes. far would you say the debris went? Did it reach from Melrose down to Clinton which is the next it, little block it, or it, further? Absolutely till Clinton. In fact the transmission was in the corner of Clinton. Did that strike you strange that it went that far? Not at that point, but looking back, absolutely. Yeah, it was pretty far. Two, two people. For me, for me, it wasn't strange. <laughs> okay, my husband and, uh, and me were completely on a different uh, angles of this story. For me, I didn't think it's, it's strange at all. It, my, uh, it's completely. Uh, it's a. Uh, if a car is flying from the uh, north to south, and it's all debris, it's most of the car parts. It was. In the in the way from north to south. Okay, so oh, on Highland, right? It's most it's most of the parties was uh, in one in one way. Yeah, one direction. Uh, how how the car it was driving in the same way it was all the parts flying. Uh, flying. Were you able to see any kind of debris, debris trail from the engine transmission piece that was near Clinton? Was there a trail, a fuel no. trail, anything? No, it wasn't. No. It no. flew. It's flying. All yeah. the part it was flying. It, it was, yeah. Nothing dragged. It flew. <laughs> it flew. Oh, no, it was it, uh, probably, uh, uh, probably transmission. It was, it was flying because it's very smooth. And it's probably from the force. It's it's probably it was uh, skidding uh, on the part. There was no signs of skidding anywhere on the, stri on yeah, the but street. Yeah, it's a smooth, smooth metal part. It's, okay, it's fine. So that's where we disagree. <laughs> now I was there and I saw the street. Uh, of course, it was not when it happened, but I was there uh, earlier in the last uh, week, and I noticed there were no marks on the street itself, uh, no marks on the curb. It really it was fascinating that there weren't even there wasn't even even a crack on the curb no, where the there, car had hit. Uh, the water pipes that were there before the tree, mm -hmm. those were broken, and you could actually see where it had been, I guess, severed. Right. He knocked down the fire hydrant and uh, the box. There was a metal box around it, round, standing about two feet up, and that was completely mangled. And that frame was also on the corner of Clinton. And you said it was mangled in 
completely yeah like screwed the metal it was like made of the metal uh, chain link kind of thing mm -hmm. uh, and it was completely uh, just security destroyed. bars yeah kind of like a security frame for that uh, hydra mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that was completely also bent all in all places just completely out of shape now some of the footage that's there from that night shows the car in the front end of the car some of it is already it, well, it looks like it's missing, and this is before they put, obviously, it's on fire, so before they put the sheet and everything over it. Did you see anything in the front of the car? Any, like, as far as the tire or anything? Was there anything there you could see? Okay, so what shows missing, it's actually, I did not leave this scene, so if you think that they, somebody took something away from this scene, no. Okay. That's why it was bent in. Okay, so everything that's there is there? It's there, yes. Okay. Nobody, nobody took any parts of the, nobody, you know, cut the piece of the car and put it away. I was there from the minute it happened to the minute they towed the car away. Okay, so when they actually got the, got the jaws of life out, they saw it in the door on the left side where the where the driver's side is, but they yes. didn't do anything else to the other side, and, and they pulled it apart, basically, with the fire truck. They yeah, they basically cut it apart, put it apart. All the pictures were taken uh, mm -hmm. by police before that. And then they got Hastings out of the car. Tell us a little bit about that. Okay, so, um, so when I... When I tell about that i just have to preface it with the fact that i was they were trying their best not to let me see it right so whatever i did see uh could have been you know kind of like a, it was hard to see right what i saw i expected after that fire to see basically body in pieces and completely black and what i saw is the full body this completely black face completely uh, burnt face up to the let's say shoulders but from shoulders down i saw the whole body which was completely intact not burned in any way i didn't know who it was but when i saw it i told my daughter it's a white guy uh, about 25 to 30 i told her it's a white young guy and uh, I'm still like doubting, like, could I see it? But I'm thinking, how possibly could I know that it's a white guy and he's 25 to 30 if I did not see the completely white arms? Not burned in any way, not touched. And from what I saw, he was wearing uh, something like a T-shirt and what I saw, the gray color, but it could have been gray from smoke. I don't know what it started as. And f as far as I could see, it was cut off sleeves. Because I saw full white arms. I even paid attention that it was, like I thought to myself, my God, in California, the guy is so white, so not tan. <laughs> But okay. now I think it's a dead body. It's right. Now, and it, it was and it was seven ish when all this happened, right? It was seven twenty to seven forty. So you have pretty good daylight at that point. Yeah, it's a completely light. Okay. And so they put him uh, on the grass, they spread the white sheet on the grass and they put him flat on his back. And the coroners went around uh, doing whatever they were doing. I could not see they were kneeling in front of him or like squatting in front of him, two coroner ladies. And then one of them pulled him by the arm to lift him on the side, to roll him on the side and checked something in the back, what I assume is back pocket of his pants to see for ID. Okay. So I clearly saw, not only was the skin not burned, it was completely intact. You could have moved the body by the arms. But they found his ID, I guess, in his pocket? It, uh, did they find it? I don't know. Okay. I, saw the, I saw the movement of the body being crawled on the side, mm -hmm. being uh, pulled by one of the arms and one of the coroners going into the back of his uh, lower part of the body so i would assume it looked to me like a back pocket of the of the were they looking for id that's my assumption right right all right well i just want to thank you so much for um, allowing us to talk to you absolutely and god bless you thank you thank you and that was
the witness from the Michael Hastings scene. So there's a lot to think about there. I'm G. Giornetta with the InfoWars Nightly News. Now you can watch The Alex Jones Show live as it happens at Infowars.com slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. More than 60 movies and documentaries all in one place at Infowars.com slash show. <laughs>